on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody it's a narrative we've heard many times before it seems on the show things used to be better 20 30 40 years ago perhaps back to the 80s uh, and that seems to be the narrative in uh, a new book uh, that's just out by Bridget Schulte. Overwork, transforming the daily grind into the quest for a better life. It seems as if we're all overworked, and Bridget is joining us appropriately enough on a Sunday. Uh, <laughs> we're both working from her home office uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, Bridget, congratulations on the new book. Is that a fair summary of of of, of the narrative of your book? That things used to be better when it come or when it came to work. That we worked less. That we were less overworked fifty years ago, forty years ago. Well, it's one of the arguments that I that I address, but it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. You know, forty or fifty years ago, there was more of a social contract. You know, between business and government and public policy and workers, there was more of a sense that as productivity rose, wages would also rise. If you look at charts from uh, Economic Policy Institute and others, you can see this steep line going from, say, the Second World War uh, up into the current moment of productivity continuing to climb, and wages in lockstep from the, the late 40s until about the 70s or 80s. And from there, wages started to stagnate. Productivity continued to, to climb. Wages haven't. They've really stagnated for those last 40 or 50 years. And so what's happening is that people are working harder and harder. We're actually working more hours. If you look um, at time use research, uh, knowledge workers tend to overwork in one job. We've got low wage workers in the richest country in the world working uh, overworking in several different jobs or side hustles because we haven't raised the minimum wage to, since 2009. It's $7.25 an hour when it should be at least $23 an hour in 2021 uh, if you adjust it for inflation. So people are working harder and harder and they are not enjoying the fruits of that labor. That's all going to the 1% that's going to capital. And so that is a huge theme in the book. It's a huge part of the, the issue that we really do need to deal with. But the other thing that the book deals with uh, is it comes from my own experience, which is as a, care, a worker with care responsibilities. I'm a mother of two. Uh, I just got back from Oregon. I have a 92 year old mother. I you know, spent time uh, taking her to medical appointments. And when you look, the Harvard Business, uh, Harvard Business School did a survey. 70% of the workers today have some kind of care responsibility. It's not just women and mothers, although they they um, take the price. If you look at the research, um, they're spending the the uh, most of the time on it. But so the other theme of the book is all of these work hours are squeezing out time for care, squeezing out time for joy, for life, for leisure, uh, and it's really time to change. And I think one of the probably one of the most important things that the book does is it shows that it's possible. It's not a pipe dream. And it's not like we did it before, because, you know, 40, 50 years ago, we still were not dealing effectively with workers with care responsibilities in the workplace. So that's why it's it's both of those things. And uh, so each of the chapter follows each of the chapters follow different change agents, really seeking to change the structure of work. You know, not just the individual here, take a bubble bath or, you know, here's a meditation app, which is sort of the way we try to deal with stress and burnout now, but really looking at how we organize work, how work processes work. And really the, the main theme of the book is that when you make work better for workers, you make it better for business, you make it better for the economy and you make it better for all of our lives. And frankly, at this moment for democracy, 
Because if you have those continuing inequality trends and in the United States, we have now, we, we now register among the highest rates of economic inequality of all advanced nations, it, that's just a recipe for political division, for social division, for a lot of what we're seeing now with threats to our democracy. It's not good for anyone. Yeah, you you've thrown the the kitchen sink in. I, I don't really understand <laughs> what the <laughs> sorry about that. What the connection is between the crisis of democracy, or what some people I don't actually believe there's a crisis of democracy. What some people believe there's a crisis of democracy, and your analysis of overwork. You had an interesting piece in the Washington Monthly recently about Trump versus Biden. Who's got more done for families and workers? And surprisingly, you your you're not com you're not convinced either uh, Trump or Biden comes out particularly, if not well. Certainly, they're no clear victor here. Uh, it, when it comes to democracy, explain what you mean. Uh, uh, when people are over overworked, are they angrier? Do they vote for uh, potential dictators? Do they not vote? How does this play out in politics? So what I was meaning is when you've got this inequality, when you've got this growing inequality, this growing sense of unfairness, this growing sense that you can work harder and harder and not get ahead, which the research is, you know, it's, it shows clearly that, um, you know, whereas 40 or 50 years ago, as you mentioned, uh, sort of the American promise was that your children would do better than you would. And that's not true. So for so many people, particularly, um, uh, people of color uh, these days. Uh, so that's a lot of what's changed. There's this, this growing sense of the system is rigged and that's what's dangerous. That's what's politically destabilizing. That's what I'm talking about. You mentioned the 1%. Um, I'm not sure if the wealthiest 1% in America even, they certainly don't need to work, whether they do work and whether they play into your analysis. But some people argue that the real problem in America is... Um, the 10 percent, the top 10 percent, yeah. the disappearance of the middle and this large underclass, what we might think of as a precariat, people who don't have full time jobs, who work many different jobs. Is, is there some truth to that? Is is, is the problem not the 1 percent, but the 10 percent, perhaps uh, in which we might include you, you and I? Well, I think I mean, all of this is this is all what we need to be thinking about and talking about the disappearance of the middle class you know that is a real concern and particularly when you've got work cultures and work structures and work policies that don't promote a middle class um why do we have so many low-wage jobs in this country why why do we allow that but, but come back to my question bridget about this the problem is not the one percent but the 10 or 15 or even 20 percent of white collar workers like you and I, who are reasonably prosperous, we probably work a little too hard, but we still do reasonably well. Yeah, I think it's all of us. It's the 10%, it's the 1%. It's, you know, when you look at larger trends, you know, why is it that it's okay for so many, uh, the 10% to have the mortgage interest re deduction, but it's not okay to have, say, paid sick days or to support childcare or to, you know, to so undervalue childcare subsidies. And, um, why do we not support more of the working and middle class? So these are legitimate questions, yes. In the 20th century, we had a concept, or 19th and 20th century, we had the concept of the working class. For people on the left, this gave work and the working class a kind of nobility for conservatives. It was more complicated. H how would you describe the working class today? Is that a term we should use? Talk about the middle class, you bemoaned its disappearance in America, but shouldn't we be proud of a working class? We should. Yeah, absolutely. It's just that right now, um, you know, if you are considered working class, sort of that middle class, lower middle class, working class, it's very difficult to survive. When you say it's very difficult to survive, what does that mean? You have to live in your car? Uh, well, you have to live in places that you don't want to live in, that you have to do more than one or two jobs? So that's some of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that really struck me when I was doing some of the research for the book is when you look at, you know, say public benefits like um, 
nutrition, uh, SNAP benefits, or you look at Medicaid and who qualifies for Medicaid. There was one uh, GAO study that found that 70% of the people on food nutrition or on Medicaid actually worked full time. So what does that tell you? It does not tell you that the working class or that workers are lazy, which is a lot of the, what you get with the political narrative. It tells you that the jobs themselves are not big enough to support human life. So you've had these decades of stagnating wages. At the same time, you've had housing costs go up. You've got so many people now who are considered housing burdened. They cannot afford the they cannot afford housing. Um, Childcare costs have gone up. Tuition costs for education have gone up. So so many food, gas, so many things that we need to pay for out of pocket to survive. Healthcare costs, all of those have gone up, and wages have not. So, so that's part of what the struggle is, you know, and the other thing that's happened with those lower wage jobs in retail or in service, um, there's been uh, this sort of trend toward unpredictable scheduling, uh, trying to like really cut labor costs and use algorithmic scheduling and trying to use technology sort of in a quote unquote smart way, but really treating human beings like widgets. So you've got so many workers who have no idea when they're going to work. They don't know how many hours they're going to work. They don't know what days they're going to work. It's very difficult to live not only with that kind of volatile income coming in. Your bills are steady, but your income goes up and down. So you can't count on that. But you can't plan your life. You can't get a second job, really. You're sort of held hostage to these kinds of work schedules. So that's another story that I tell in the book is, uh, you know, just how difficult that makes life to try to live in that way. But then there's a really powerful and uh, I think very hopeful movement of workers and unions and organizers coming together and advocates coming together to really work on pushing for fair and predictable schedules. And so there's legislation that's passed in certain cities and the entire state of Oregon. There are many companies that have um, committed to either fair schedules or two weeks notice or to, to dispense with on-call scheduling where you know you always have to be vigilant and waiting so you can't like live your life because you might get a call to come in or you might get sent home. Um, so there are, uh, so that's just one example of how difficult it is for many working class people to try to survive and how there's really a hopeful, in my view, um, effort to try to change that. I want to get to the solutions after the break. But before we get there, um, you wrote an interesting piece for The Guardian about women and work. Um, this was uh, in 2019. Uh, the title was A Woman's Greatest Enemy, A Lack of Time to Herself. A lot of uh, the critique of our work culture that you've presented, I think, in this first part of the interview suggests that women are, as caregivers, as primary caregivers, as mothers, as daughters, um, are more affected by this. It, 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 would that be fair, Bridget, or is it men and women are being equally overworked? So when it comes to the overwork culture, um, everyone is affected by that. Everyone is affected by sort of ideal worker standards that you have to be put work first and be work devoted and that we reward the people who used to come in earliest, but maybe now log on earliest and stay latest. There is this sort of work devotion um, that research shows we tend to reward and worship in the United States. Um, that also tends to be, that tends to favor people who don't have care responsibilities because they're able to spend more of that time and effort and attention at work. For women, you're really pulled in two different directions. You've got sort of um, Claudia Golden, the feminist economist, she calls who's it. Been, yeah, who's been? Claudia was on the show a couple of years ago. Yeah, she's wonderful. She calls it greedy institutions. You've got greedy work that's becoming even greedier, and at the same time, you've had these sort of intensification standards for what we expect a good mother or a good caregiver to be. So, you, for a lot of women, you're just really pulled in two different directions at once. Well, what does this suggest to? The conservatives, and maybe a lot of this was begun by Phyllis Shafley in the in the seventies and eighties. The idea that uh, traditional marriage is is of great value, and 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 women would be better off staying at home as housewives and mothers. That may not always be realistic, but 
Is that a problem, Bridget, or one of the solutions? You know, I think the solutions are really all about opportunity and choice and freedom. And if that's what one family or chooses to do, you know, that should be that should be an opportunity or a choice for them. It's not something I wanted to do. I mean, I would ask you, is that is, you know, if that was your only option. Well, I mean, uh, I, if, if my wife uh, let me stay at home and look up, well, not that we have our, our children have grown up now, but uh, I, I would be open to it. I mean, I'm not a, a Shaffley person, but uh, it's an interesting argument. What about America? You, you, you're at the New America. It's not. It's just called New America now. It used to be the New yeah. America Foundation. You right. run their Better uh, Life Lab. Uh, Bridget, we often this often comes up in the show. Is is this a, an American problem or is it a global one? Um, if we were in Denmark, for example, or Norway or Germany, uh, might we be having this kind of conversation? So there's a very particular U.S. context here, definitely. And one is that, say, if you live in a place like Scandinavia or you live in Europe, you have much more public policy guardrails. You have the European Work Time Directive. So your hours are limited. Um, you have a lot of public policy that supports people who choose to, it makes it easier to combine work and care. And I suppose that's what the big argument that, that sort of I'm after is, how do you create those kinds of opportunities where people can make choices so it's easier to combine work and care in ways that you choose? And if that means staying at home, you know, it, it, that's sort of out of the realm of the possible for many people right now, simply because of how expensive things are. You know, if you live in Japan, for instance, they're much more like the U.S. context. There's there they have overwork to the point of death, <laughs> you know, so so it, it is a U.S. context but it also applies in other places. You've also got South Korea, which has really long hours. You've got China, you know, the 999, you know. Yeah. Um, Bridget, some people might be listening to this and said, well, the problem with Europe is that their overregulated economies has resulted in economic decline. And whilst some of the things perhaps you're saying are true, nonetheless, the American economy still dominates the world, still the engine of the world economy. Wall Street is a record highs. Profits of large corporations are at record highs. Um, so there is uh, some argument for our current arrangement, or is that wrong? Well, if you use the measures that we typically measure, that we typically use, if you use the stock market, well, half of Americans don't have a single penny in the stock market. If you use measures like GDP and growth, well, then sure, yeah, we are the wealthiest country. But if you've got the highest, one of the highest rates of maternal mortality, particularly for black people, black uh, birthing people, if you've got high rates of child poverty, which we do, you know, if you've got all of these other indicators, if you've got this economic inequality, if you've got so many people who are, uh, we've got, you know, deaths of despair, you, you know, we've got, uh, you know, chronic overwork that. Uh, there's been some analysis that, uh, you know, makes work so stressful that it's actually become the fifth leading cause of death. So when you've got all of these other factors and you're looking at all sorts of other things that GDP again, doesn't the, measure. The fifth leading cause of death is stress through work. Is, is there are 10 psychosocial stressors at work. This is a, one of the things that I address in one of the chapters. There was a, a group of researchers from Stanford and Harvard and they, and they took 200 different uh, stress and health, stress and health kinds of work, stress and health uh, studies, and did a meta analysis of 200 of them. And they found that these just simply the way that we work, which is long work hours, work family conflict, lack of access to, to uh, health insurance, a toxic boss, or feeling like, you know, you put in more effort than the reward you get back. Just those factors alone um, lead to both acute um, you know, the stress that is so acute that it could lead to heart attacks and strokes in the moment. It leads to chronic illness over time because you get exhausted. So you don't feel like making dinner uh, with healthy stuff. And then you don't feel like going to the gym. And then, you know, you might, uh, you know, that might end up in cardiovascular disease or cancer or in inflammation. So you've got acute and chronic stress uh, effects. And so they found in their uh, in their view that uh, work itself has become 
the fifth leading cause of death. And this was before the pandemic. So I, I you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the, what the research would show now, but this was uh, Jeff Pfeffer's work out of Stanford and Joel Go and, and colleagues in Harvard. Wow. Chilling. It's good reason not to work. Fifth highest, uh, fifth, fifth, be- fifth biggest cause of death, overwork. I don't think I'm going to die of that. What about you, Bridget? Are you an overwork? Will you I, die of that maybe? I hope I don't, uh, you know, but I, it's certainly something I do work too much. Well, we're going to take a break, give you a break for the moment so you won't at least die during this conversation. <laughs> I want to thank uh, our friends at Liberties, a new quarterly of culture and politics. They work very hard, but not too hard. I hope they all don't die of overwork uh, because they've been very supportive of our show. We're going to run a short feature on Liberties, and then we'll be back with Bridget Schulte, the author of Overwork, to talk specifically. She's laid out the problems, very chilling problems, and what we're going to do in the second half of the show is figure out how we can fix overwork. So don't go away, anyone. Don't work. We'll be back in a second. The noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with Bridget Schulte, the author of Overwork. She also runs uh, the Better Life Lab at uh, uh, at New America. She's based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Bridget, where do we start in terms of fixing? In the first half of the show, you laid out the chilling realities of our work life. You said it's the fifth. Uh, overwork is the fifth uh, largest cause of, a, of an early death. Do we begin with corporations or the government? Where would you begin in terms of fixes? So there are three, there are really three ways, three levels that you need to be looking at and all in concert. Right now, we tend to look at the individual and we think, you know, if you're stressed out, if you're burned out, you know, you just, you need to you know, deal with this as an individual. Get a new problem. job, right? <laughs> oh yeah, you'll get a new job if you can. Right, if you are a low wage worker, we'll go through workforce training, get a better job. And to which I would say, what better job? Um, you know, so, so that we tend to have this very individualized focus. You need more education. You need to, a meditation app. Here's lunchtime. Okay, and that's a, a mirror of the neoliberal revolution since the 80s, which I, I guess you're suggesting has caused the problem in the first place. It's been part of the problem. Absolutely. So there is a role for, for individual solutions because that is where we live, you know, so there is individual agency. But there's also really important ways to change by banding together through workers coming together, sort of bottom up through union efforts, through organizing. There's sort of middle out. There's um, middle managers who have a lot of power to change even in their teams. And then that can sort of burble out. Lots of opportunities there. Um, A lot of advocacy groups and organizations that are really fighting. Um, And I can tell a great story about uh, one group really trying to take on doctor burnout, which is a huge problem. Yeah, and we dealt with that. We have um, a regular show with a a Silicon Valley-based medical authority on on the miserable quality of life amongst doctors. Yeah, it's awful. It's really, and it's, and we should all be very worried about that. But there's also organizational change. There's leaders. And, uh, you know, as well as policy change. So we can, especially in the United States, because we don't have a really strong policy regime because of our politics, corporations have outsized power and they can move quickly. They can do a lot. So there is a role for everyone to play. So we've got three buckets, as you say. There's the personal, the corporate, and there's the regulatory or the governmental. We We've done quite a lot of shows on this. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Marcus Buckingham, who um, believes that work sometimes can love us back. He was responding to another journalist. I'm sure you're familiar with her book, Sarah Jaffe, Work Won't Love You Back. But Buckingham believes that work can be meaningful. Is he right? Is the challenge for us individually to find work that's meaningful or to establish a work-life balance and to perhaps purge ourselves of the 
children's story that work can define our lives? Well, I think it's complicated. You know, when you think about like, what is it that work, you know, what is our lives, what is it that our life is about? Um, you know, there are, uh, Eric Erickson, a uh, Harvard psychologist, he said, you know, a meaningful life, a good life has three great arenas. And one is work, another one is love, and another one is play. So I think that there's a real human need to have meaningful work. But I guess my first point in my book is that I think about work much bigger than just what we do for pay. You know, my work is, is what I do for the Better Life Lab or the writing that I do. But it's also all of the unpaid work of care and home that I do. It's the volunteering that I do. It's the, you know, community involvement. It's civic involvement. So I think the first, the first, first thing that we need to do is think about work in a much bigger way. How are you universalizing the concept of work? In those terms, everything's work. I mean, when you read a book, you're you're making yourself smarter. When you're asleep, you're recharging yourself. Aren't you aren't you broadening what work means to make it everything? Uh, what I what I would argue is that work is just about everything that isn't leisure. Yeah. But isn't um, leisure about work too? I mean, the whole point of work is to realize leisure. Well, that's what Aristotle said. You know, I don't well, know that. That's, right? I don't know that that is the point. The point of you know. Well, what you do know, you do for leisure that isn't work? What I do for I, you know, there's an awful lot that I do. Uh, I just got back from Oregon. I love to play in the waves. I love to go swim. You know, I went whitewater rafting. That's definitely play. Um, you know, I go running. Uh, you know, that's something I really enjoy. Well, the, the, the the sort of the standard narrative is that we work hard and then we play hard. So we, we earn enough money so that we can afford to go to Oregon to enjoy the waves or nature. Is that wrong? Well, so, but what I'm saying is that it's not just what we do for pay. It's all of this care that we do as well, that we've tended to think of as invisible. You know, when you say you work hard and then you play, I would include care work in that. I would include the work that we do to to run homes, to make them homes. That's but a lot that, of work. That be, I mean, we've we've had arguments about this, Bridget, and it, it's an ongoing and a very interesting argument. I mean, should mothers or pair or children should they be paid for their parenting work, for their looking after of elders, or or should it be a kind of moral calculus? How, how should we determine this? Well, well. Right now, we tend to think of care as this labor of love, as a sort of sacred zone that that money would sully. You know, and I'm I'm not saying that the answer is that you pay mothers or you pay fathers. You know, I think the answer is we need to find ways to value that work in a way that it is not valued now. It is not valued monetarily. It is not valued in terms of time. Uh, you know, and then all you have to do is look at the paid care work. It's among the lowest paid of all of the occupations. We tend to think that it's it doesn't require skill. I would defy anyone to spend a day in the life uh, of the shoes of a home care worker and tell me that that isn't skilled work. Well, it's, yeah, and, and the same is true of nursing. I'm not sure, though, you're right on the, the caring. I mean, you're a parent. I'm a parent. Um, we're not looking to be paid either in financial or moral terms, we get satisfaction, or most of us, I think, I can't speak on behalf of all parents, but then we get satisfaction out of doing what we at least think is a decent job. But what I'm saying is, when you have a culture that does not value that, that makes it, that yeah, I mean, yeah, very Richard, difficult. That's wrong. I mean, when you any just go into the, the latest Hollywood movie, it's always about selfless parents. It's always about caring for others, whether it's true or not. I, I think our culture does value caring, maybe sometimes hypocritically, but nonetheless, no, it's very rare to see a film where someone's saying, well, you shouldn't look after your parents or you shouldn't care about your kids. So I guess what I would argue back, you know, I, I'm, uh, it, you know, we are human and caring is part of what makes us human. So then it's, it's part of the human story, which is why it is part of the Hollywood story. But my argument is, you don't see that value in terms of uh, in terms of time. We see we tend to value work, and we expect people to work and work as if they didn't have care responsibilities, uh, you know, and care as if they didn't have work responsibilities. We make it very difficult to have time 
to feel that that is value, to feel that there is that time that you can take to do a good job at work, you know, and to come home and still have time for that kind of for that. So, kind so is of that a, a regulatory issue? I know you've written about um, uh, the right, essentially, to get away from work, the right to disconnect. You're a big mm -hmm. fan of, of of that legislation in in California. Is that the kind of regulation that you think might begin to address this? That we should have essentially rights protected by the state to not work when at some point in the day, even if we have jobs? So I, I guess when you say I'm a big fan of that, I, I don't know that I would describe myself as that because in the in the in the, that piece that you mentioned, what I'm arguing is that that's not enough. It's not enough for what we need. It's it could be a beginning if it's done well. Um, so what I'm arguing is that yeah, where is our paid family leave? Where is our paid sick days? You know, yes, we absolutely need more of a structure to protect us from. Um, constant overwork. When we had the, you know, a couple of years ago when the rail workers were striking and, you know, we were talking about, you know, the Biden administration got in because we were talking about this could tank the economy. People were very worried about it. What did they want? They wanted paid sick days. They wanted time off when they were sick or they needed time to care for their family. They wanted well-being. They wanted time for themselves. So this is what I'm arguing. Yes, we are the only advanced economy with no paid maternity leave, which is really nothing short of cruel. We have no paid family medical leave. So we don't have any guarantee that we get time off when we need it to care or care for ourselves when we get sick. We don't have any paid sick days. We, have, we, we, we spend among the least amount to support people um, with childcare responsibilities. So why can't we see these as all part of a public good, all part of our common good, that when we have time to care for ourselves and our families, we work better, work is better, we're happier, we're more productive. You know, so we might not feel like we're constantly working harder and harder and falling farther and farther behind. Do some companies, uh, Bridget, do a better job than others? Um... I know you've written extensively in the book and, and elsewhere on the childcare crisis. You've talked about this. I know some of the big tech companies out here in, on the West Coast do a better job than others, I think, um, in terms of uh, some of the things you're talking about. Uh, are there models in the book of companies that are more enlightened? Yes, there absolutely are. Absolutely. I guess what I would say to that is, you know, corporations, companies have an awful lot of power. They can do a lot that's, you know, that's that's really good and helpful, and many are. I think where we need to be thinking about public policy is you can see that right now. Right now, if you're going to have those kind of well-being and care benefits, there is such an inequality. If you tend to be a knowledge worker or you tend to have a, a higher income or you work for a, a kind of a, in a white collar job, you're much more likely to have paid sick days, paid vacation days, uh, paid family leave. Paid Baba, uh, days. I'm coming back to my question. Can you give me some examples of companies that you admire that, that, that other companies should emulate? Right. But the point that I wanted to make and why there is a role for the public policy is that you don't see that for low wage workers. That's where you see such a disconnect, and that's where there's room for public policy. But yes, uh, no, I, I take that point, and we've already acknowledged that there are three buckets to do this. But are, are there companies that come out of this? I mean, Amazon claims to really look after its workers, although a lot of the reporting on Amazon suggests the reverse. Uh, what do you think of some of these tech companies, Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, on, on the work front? Well, I think that there are other other sectors to look at, you know, especially in uh, finance, tech. You know, when you look at their, they had those massive layoffs earlier this year. You know, uh, layoffs are a, a huge issue in the United States. But there are companies. For one, there's uh, there's a the software company that I do talk about in one of the chapters. It's called Blackbaud, and what they did is during the pandemic. You know, they had been a traditional kind of bricks and mortar kind of store or. Uh, organization where people had to come in. If you wanted to progress in, in the organization, you had to move your whole family to one of the headquarters. And that's a very difficult uh, you know, for a family to do. Typically, um, 
uh, that's one of the ways where um, women and people of color can often get sort of knocked off the promotion and leadership track. Um, men are much more likely to be the ones to move for a job, and then uh, the woman is typically more the trailing spouse. So one of the things during the pandemic, they had to go like everybody uh, that could, they went all virtual. And then over time, they did a really good job of talking to people, talking to their, you know, talking to the employees, what were they dealing with? What did they need? And really thinking through their work processes on the other, um, on the other hand, what's our value? What is it that we're making? What is it that we do? What's the most important thing? And really focusing work systems and processes around that rather than in many of our work organizations, it's a lot about the performance of work. Look, I'm here, I'm, I'm working hard, even though you, you know, maybe you're answering emails. There's a lot of waste. There's a lot of kind of stupid work in our you data know, work. One of, your, one of your remarks earlier that, about layoffs. Are you suggesting companies, big tech companies, they've been doing layoffs all year, companies like um, Microsoft and Apple and, and Google, should they be allowed to do layoffs? I mean, their argument would be if we had their CFO or senior executive on the show, they would say, well, we got a cut uh, uh, and we want to be more profitable. So it's not so much about you know responding to everything with regulation, but I think what's really important is why? Why do the layoffs? And when you look at why and you look at the research around why companies lay off, is that oftentimes, you know, it's uh, you cut those labor costs, then your books are going to look better for Wall Street for the quarterly reports. And so then your stock's going to do better. So when you are managing for the short term for Wall Street, you have a much different kind of management style that actually isn't good for, for workers. And so if you can take a longer term view, um, and so I do talk about in the, in the book, I talk about a private equity investor Warren Valdmanis with Two Sigma Impact. And he will only invest in companies that guarantee good jobs. And part of that is taking a longer term view and not being caught up in that Wall Street quarterly reporting, earn, the quarterly earnings cycle. You know, we've all complained about that for years. And even people in business talk about this short termerism that leads to these kind of like quick, shorter, uh, kind of decisions that aren't good for the long term. I think Bridget, that's we, we, we need done, to think about. Yeah, we've, we've done many jobs also on unions and labor organization. Ultimately, to have muscle at the table, whether it's with your corporate boss or with the government, it is the real challenge and opportunity, stronger unions, different kinds of unions, especially unions built around the more, the more sort of precarious nature of our economy? Yeah, I think unions are a huge part of the answer. You know, having worker power, worker voice. You know, there's plenty of good models around the country, uh, around the, or uh, well, there are good models here in the United States. Um, you know, SEIU has done an amazing job trying to organize people. There have been worker organizations, maybe not technically unions, but, uh, you know, worker centers that are really trying to get people together. When you look at like gig workers, gig workers rising, um, those were Uber, Uber drivers. You know, they're so isolated. A lot of these kind of gig contract workers, they don't know that what they're experiencing, so many other people are as well. And they got together at the, you know, at the airport, you know, kind of trading stories and then came together to demand better conditions. So there's no doubt that having more worker power, more worker voice, would make things an awful lot better in this in this country. Let's end, uh, Bridget, in the longer term. We're talking about the shorter term. We've done many shows on, uh, according to somebody like James Sussman, a, uh, an anthropologist, a work anthropologist, what does work look like in a post-job society? And of course, AI is threatening to, to turn work into, uh, uh, or, or, or AI is threatening perhaps to, to do away with all jobs. What's your long-term prognosis, both in the best and the worst case, particularly with AI now more than on the horizon, actually changing the nature of work, changing the nature of corporations, and indeed driving the current boom on Wall Street? Right. Well, I end the book with sort of three scenarios, three future scenarios. And one is that we continue on business as usual. And so we've got increasing inequality. 
We've got increasing precarity at, you know, at all levels. You know, we just talked about layoffs. So what had once been stable white collar jobs are no longer that way. So if we've got this increasing precarity, you've got what the MIT economist David Otter has called the potential to have a society of the servers and the served. So I, I find that terrifying, but that is one potential future. A second potential future is we recognize that with AI and technology, that there will be a future with potentially less work. And so then do we decide that the, the jobs that we do create will be big enough to sustain human life? And then if they're not, will we have sort of the public, public policy that would then help support human life? Will we have things like a guaranteed income or a guaranteed jobs program? Or you know, will there be some kind of public response to that? That's a second scenario. And the third scenario sort of goes back to the point I made earlier. What if we thought about work in a very different way? What if work is not just what we do for pay, but our care work, the, the contributions we make to our communities and our society, that's all hard work. What does the future look like when that does become work? And so, you know, how you pay for that, that's a big question, you know, but, but these are sort of the three scenarios that I can, I can foresee. It's the multi-trillion dollar question, Bridget. And finally, you're the author of um, Overwork, Transforming the Daily Grind in the Quest for a Better Life. All authors know that writing a book is the ultimate daily grind. What did you learn or not learn about work in, in, in writing Overwork in terms of what it's like? It's obviously, you have a day job, so I assume you're not paying all your bills through this book. But what can the authorship of a book and the process, which can be enormously challenging and lonely, but also very exciting, what does it teach us about the better life, our, our quest for a better life in terms of work? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Like, why do, why do we do what we do? You know, this is a book I've been working on for 10 years. The minute I stopped, uh, I finished the first book, uh, I was- Yeah, uh, and your first book was called uh, Overwhelmed, Work, Love and Play When No One Has the Time. So in a sense, it's the second volume in some of these themes. It's, it, 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 it's a continuation of that journey that I began on that book. And when I finished that, which is all about time and that the sort of the greedy, uh, the greedy nature of both institutions that I was talking about earlier, um, pulling, uh, you know, people with care responsibilities in particular in two different directions. I really wanted to look at work culture because it seemed that so much of the pressure of the greediness and, and sort of that time pressure came from work. And so I really spent a lot of time, there's a lot of journalism and reporting in this book. And I think what I, it really opened my eyes. You know, the first book was very much through my experience and my lens. And the second book, is really the, the experience of so many different workers in so many different uh, situations. But I also knew that I didn't wanna spend 10 years learning how terrible things were. I needed some hope. And so I really spent uh, a lot of time looking for people who were trying to change things fundamentally. And you know, one person that I met that I was very inspired by said, you know, we don't need more resilient canaries, we need a new coal mine. And so I went looking for people who were trying to build new coal mines. Well, Bridget Schulte, author of Overwork, Transforming the Daily Grind in the Quest for a Better Life. I hope uh, you'll have some time in the future to come back on the show. These issues aren't going away. They're increasingly central in our lives. Thank you so much and congratulations on the new book. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been wonderful talking with you.